Yes, and I, I believe at the time, um, uh, after you had moved into the uh, to your new place, um, uh, she had uh, you and her had actually uh, uh, planned to uh, to get married. You were actually in the process when all of this happened, and that um, uh, she uh, had actually uh, become pregnant. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. She, uh, like I said, she was um, she was pregnant with our, with our child, and uh, she was very happy. I was very, very happy about it, um, and it was, it wasn't an accident, it was planned, and this was something that we were both looking very forward to. Now, during the week uh, that I was uh, without communication with the rest of my father showed up uh, at my uh, bond hearing, basically, he informed me at that time that Larissa had a misconception. I was, all I could think about was I was just literally on my knees begging the court to let me go home and take care of her. Uh, I, and I still refer to her as my wife. Uh, of which, uh, honestly, they didn't blink an eye. As a matter of fact, I believe that uh, in the coming time during your incarceration, you had several uh, ma male correspondences with Alyssa, and she actually signed her name with her last name. Melissa Keeter, and we actually have photographs of those uh, letters, which I'm going to be attaching to the end of this interview for all of you. And in and in my hometown, uh, we would introduce each other uh, as as husband and wife. And she at home, uh, which always brought a smile on my face when we were home together, she would refer to me to my face as as my husband. And uh, I, it was honestly. I can still hear it. still music in my ears when I hear say that. But, um, yeah, it was, uh, the, at that point uh, in my life, it was definitely the worst day of my life, the day that they took me away and, and everything. We, uh, uh, I can honestly say, Larissa was extremely happy, and in turn, which made me extremely happy. And it was, I will never forget, before all the, that happened, that very same morning, I was looking out of her bedroom window and a light snow was falling. And I was thanking God for making all my dreams come true. Four hours later, I was in the house and I was shot over a charge that I knew nothing. In the uh, coming years, uh, since after your incarceration, I believe they held you for uh, almost five years on what proved to actually be a misdemeanor charge. Yes, sir. It is written in the uh, in the federal codes uh, how the 18922 code and 18924 code start is like unless otherwise specified, and they give the charge for an individual uh, the sale of a straw purchased weapon to a felon is a felon. Mm -hmm. However. To a licensed firearm dealer, uh, it's basically a paperwork violation, uh, which is only uh, can only be a misdemeanor. And did they attach a uh, a minimal sentence or fine to that particular misdemeanor? Most gun dealers that get charged with a paperwork violation uh, usually have to pay about a thousand dollar fine. Uh, they don't lose their business license. It's kind of it's, Almost like a federal speeding ticket. Gotcha. The uh, there's very little action done to it. They just tell the dealer be more careful next time. Mm -hmm. So to to sum all of this up, basically the ATF hired a felon to commit a felony to charge you with a felony on what would have been a misdemeanor if they could have approved some kind of intent, which it doesn't sound like they could have. That's basically the long and short of it. Yes, sir. Yes. And the uh, they held me in that regional jail. I pleaded not guilty. Mm -hmm. They held me in that regional jail for about six months. Now, at that, by this time, I was in communication with Larissa. All they wanted me to do was to sign a plea. I asked my attorney at that time, knowing there was a misdemeanor conviction, he, he included that, yeah, uh, as far as doing any time, you've already served all the time you're going to serve, just sign the plea and go home. I talked with Larissa about that. We all agreed to the same thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's time to come. Just go ahead and sign this plea and we'll go, which I did.
The very next day, after not being able to get a court hearing day uh, for six months, at this time, uh, they were ready to see me in court the very next day, in which, uh, this was in May, I've been incarcerated since uh, January, or February, excuse me, and they set up a hearing date uh, for sentencing in August. Now, in August, it was my understanding, still, that I was going to be released. Whereas the court, even though the sales took place in my shop, following all state and federal paperwork uh, regulations, they decided not to try me as a federal firearms dealer, but as an individual making the charge of felony. Mm -hmm. So they charged you for what they hired somebody to do to you, basically. Yes, sir. Yeah. And, yeah, that, that is the beauty of the current American justice system, ladies and gentlemen. And um, as a result of this, you were uh, sentenced uh, to, uh, I believe it was, uh, you, you served a, a little under five years. Fifty-seven months. Fifty-seven months total on a misdemeanor that would have ordinarily been a paper violation. And this was basically a bait and switch where you could basically refer to this as a rogue court, basically. They basically switched around the laws. They supplanted the function of the United States legislature and the American people and basically did what ever they pleased. And I, I would say this is probably why a lot of people fear going into the courtroom, uh, because this stuff can happen, especially in federal court. Um, uh, the federal government is actually uh, exempt from uh, entrapment violations, so they can basically lie to you and not have to uh, pay any consequences for it either. But moving back now, uh, during the, uh, the first couple of years of your incarceration, you were in constant contact with Larissa. And I have already previously published uh, some of the letters of some of your correspondence. And there was a noted, uh, notedly upbeat nature to the early letters. And then later, as things progressed, things went a little bit downhill. Can you just give us basically an overview of what was going on while you were away, according to your communications with those who were around here? Because I know this is all secondhand information, but you had spoken directly with Larissa and she relayed to you in a lot of cases on the phone or by letter what was going on. Yes, sir. Yeah. The, uh, again, as I, and I like to state this, we had just moved uh, into our new home. Mm -hmm. um, Doug was uh, still in Florida, and as like, uh, we like to say at that point, he was in the rearview mirror. He was no longer a part of the system. Mm -hmm. Once I was incarcerated, Doug found out about it, uh, he came here to Virginia. Uh, it was only supposed to be temporary because we, everyone felt that I was going to be, be home as soon as this uh, charge was brought to life out of court. Uh, he moved into our home. Uh, social services came back after they had agreed to give Larissa uh, custody back of her son. They came into the house, saw that Doug was there. It was, was a direct violation mm -hmm. of the uh, conditions for Larissa to get her child back. Mm -hmm. uh, so therefore, uh, the offer was taken off the table for Larissa to get her own custody back to Tristan. Mm -hmm. Still, we had not given up hope at that time uh, that once we got this matter straight that was forced upon us, that we would still be able uh, at some point in time start the process back over and bring the child back home. The, um, after a year of me being gone, we lost our home, uh, in which, at which time Larissa got a, uh, a small apartment uh, in Waverly. Uh, again, uh, Doug came in tow, and uh, a good friend of our family, uh, as well as my family, were helping Larissa in any, any and all ways that they, can, they could. And uh, this other gentleman, Glenn, uh, was nice enough to give Doug a job uh, at his gas station, sweeping floors, running deliveries, whatever, kind of to subsidize uh, any help that he was giving Larissa directly. 